And the, the PowerPoint test was successful. Thank you. Good afternoon um, and welcome to the county's Children, Seniors, and Families Committee. And I'm going to ask the clerk to begin by calling the roll. Vice Chairperson Arenas. Here. And Chairperson Chavez. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also ask if all of my colleagues could just introduce themselves on the dais. And Dr. Luna, may we start with you? 
Good afternoon, Bruce Elena, Deputy County Executive, covering for the Office of the County Exec today. Michaela Lewis, Assistant County Counsel. Good afternoon, Daniel Little, Director of uh, uh, Social Service Agency. Good afternoon, Ignacio Guerrero, Director for the Department of Child Support Services. Good afternoon, Bolivon Kegaris, Deputy Chief Probation Officer, sitting for um, Chief Nick Burchard. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sarah Duffy, Chief Children's Officer, Office of Children and Family Policy. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to go to public comment, and this is an opportunity to speak to an item that is not on the agenda but within the purview of this committee. We currently have two speakers online. Should I set the timer for three minutes for the person? All right, next speaker is resident. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hey, yes, hello, good afternoon. Um, my kids are being sexually abused. Uh, my eldest son, um, he confirmed that beginning from the age of 13, um, my ex-wife was allowing a man to anally rape him. So um, the other kids have also shown signs of being sexually abused. And I made a report about eight years ago uh, to CPS telling them about some of the abuse. I didn't have the confirmation about my son yet, so I didn't make that and nothing was done. And then over three months ago, it was suggested to me um, by Mr. Wright, by Damien Wright, that I should make another report. So over three months ago, I made another report and I included the information about what my son had told me. And nothing was done because there's a, a, there happens to be a conflict of interest in this case uh, with my former attorney, Valerie Houghton. So I, uh, uh, Mr. Little, Daniel Little, he has all the details. And I went to him again and I said, um, have you done a, a, an assessment? Do you intend on doing one? How are you gonna address these conflicts of interest? I asked them multiple times and I finally did get a response and the response was, hey, if you wanna make a report, here's the number, call that number, uh, CPS and make a report. Not, not, he won't answer any questions. Will he do an assessment? Has he done one? I mean, my assumption is that he hasn't done one. And that, that's just plain wrong. And this happened on another case when he was head of D, D, uh, the Department of uh, Family and Children's Services. Uh, Violet Brooks came to him and she said that her three daughters were being sexually abused and nothing was done. And those kids endured the abuse until they were 18. And um, recently they did take legal action, the, daughter, the daughters. I mean, you can look this up on, on, the, on the court website, sescourt.org. Uh, you look up Mackenzie Brooks. She outlines all the sexual abuse that she endured. Um, I mean, it's just unacceptable that people are doing favors for these attorneys and letting the sexual abuse go on. Um, it, it's just wrong. I mean, it should be a knee-jerk reaction that when somebody reports sexual abuse or any kind of other abuse, that something somebody does something. And I mean, this is carrying over to other cases. Uh, I mean, we just had this recent death of the baby, um, baby Phoenix. I mean, it's, it, I mean. Not, nothing has changed. I mean, he came to the meeting after the death and he, he acted all concerned and stuff, but he's not. He does not care about other people. All he wants to do is favors for other people. He, he, we really should consider replacing him. We need to put somebody who cares, who has empathy. Thank you. Next speaker is Paul Soto. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from Horseshoe, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, it's really hard to hear the gentleman speak. He's been coming to you for about, uh, my estimation, 18 months with his concerns. And now I'm very concerned as a citizen that nothing has been done to either discredit what he is saying to completely discredit it or to affirm it. It's something needs to be done, something. So that either he could be discredited and like, no, there's nothing to substantiate what your claims are or 
to affirm them and start doing something about them. Because if a woman came in here and said that she was a victim of domestic violence or something like that, you guys would be tripping all over each other to ensure that she is given the proper respect and care that she needs. I don't see that happening with this gentleman. So the issue that I'd like to talk about is redlining. Now, redlining is coming up as an issue for San Francisco. Now, children, seniors, and families are the primary victims of the segregation policies that occurred in this county and in this city since 1940, when that redlining map was created and Hillview Airport was built. Because DDTs were loaded on those planes and were poisoning and killing people in my community in Sasi Puedes because Hillview Airport was strategically placed there by the county in order to facilitate the spraying of DDT pesticides on my population. So I take it personal. Secondly, is the, what, how that relates to children, seniors, and families is because there are generational impacts to redlining. And this, the county of San Francisco is acknowledging that. They are acknowledging that. And what I want to know is either this county is going to acknowledge the premise of my uh, entire advocacy, which has been the consequences of redlining, or just say that it doesn't exist and cancel your racial equity policy. It has to be one or the other. We can't continue to go on faking and acting like there's no generational consequence to redlining. They have been political, they've been social, and they've been economic. And you keep trying to fix some problem, but you never get at what the core of the issue really is. And that is that the children, seniors, and families are the most vulnerable to the generational impacts of redlining because redlining is not properly contextualized within these conversations. And because of that, you're never going to get to a solution because the problem is the way that this government, both the county and the city, were responsible for that, for that bestial, racially uh, uh, motivated segregation policy of redlining. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I'm now going to um, go to item three on our agenda, but we don't have any um, anything on consent, and it, unless uh, anybody has a change to the agenda, seeing none, I'm going to move on to item four, and this is to receive our bi-monthly report from the Office of Supportive Housing and Fleets and Facilities on the Hub. I don't know if we have. Who is presenting on that? I have Consuelo in my notes, but I don't see her. Good afternoon. This is KJ Kaminsky, Deputy Director for the Office of Supportive Housing. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a very brief report that the project is under construction um, and there's, there's no change to the schedule. Um, but we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. I, um, I do have a couple of questions. And one is, um, I would like us to make sure that we put a date uh, for opening on our schedule. I know that's a hard thing, uh, but if we don't have a date, um, then TBD is, uh, you know, it's... It's concerning, uh, not concerning, but you know, we should, we should have a goal here. Um, and maybe I could ask, and I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask this of uh, KJ, but if you could just maybe take a moment to, to walk through the, um, the schedule. And, and what I'm particularly interested in is how we get from the, where we are today, frankly, to whatever the opening day is going to be, if there are any um, concerns or issues that you see in the in the next year relative to the to the opening. Thank you for the question, um, Chairperson Chavez. So um, right now we are under construction um, with a target to begin. Uh, lease up in March of 2025, um, or sorry, in a, in a, we're ahead of schedule. The current timeline is October of 2024, um, with an estimated completion uh, of construction in June of 2025. 
Um, so the, the relocation process would start in July and I'm happy to uh, work with the team to provide a, an estimated opening day um, on the next report uh, uh, to this committee. Oh, got it. And I don't anticipate any, any changes, but if there's any specific um, concerns that we can follow up and include in the next report, we'd be happy to do that. KJ, that's very helpful. And I, I do think that, um, again, I, I think just giving an opening, even if it's not an opening day, just an opening month, uh, because, I, you know, and what I what I know will be the opening for the, there's a, the relocation process for the hub, but the this, uh, certificate of occupancy date is the one that I'm, that actually for me, that's the one that I look at for these lists. And I don't, I don't see what that, that, um, that date is on this timeline. So maybe just add that. That's probably the biggest indicator of how quickly people can get into it or you know, the, the young people will be able to get into their new homes. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And then a second question that I have, um, KJ, this is probably um, not for you, but for um, staff is that I understand that there has been some um, consideration as to whether or not the uh, Dan, this is actually for you. Whether or not the current hub will stay open as the new hub begins operation. And what I've been told is that some of the young folks would like to have some facility or um, a meeting place on the east side of San Jose. And I'm wondering if you could just spend a minute to talk about that relative to this item. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. I, you know, I know that we've had discussions in the past about that site in general, um, specifically related to the work around the Family Resource Center and that work, um, as well as the, the hub site. Um, the last information I have is that we're still planning on operating um, a, a DFCS-specific program out of that site. So um, I would have to verify, because I know that the hub site is, is in the same facility, but it's a slightly different space. So let me verify that that space is going to continue to be available. Well, and two things um, that I would just say um, for you and um, Supervisor Aranas, this, this uh, is something that I, I fear will end up being on your to-do list. Um, and that is that one of the reasons that we were looking so uh, aggressively for a new location is the current um, location is not easy for us to use. And I've been interested in us ending the contract where we are today and finding a, an appropriate location for the services because we, we had a difficult time when the young people wanted a washer and dryer, when they wanted a shower. We, they The um, landlord would not let the young people do an event outside their building on the weekends, you know, just, and we're paying so much for the rent. I just think, seriously. Um, so what I um, was, what I am really interested in doing is uh, having fleets and facilities through the through your office take a look at what services you you need to stay in that area and whether or not it's appropriate for us to stay at that location. Um, because I frankly, if we're going to spend money on rent, which I don't like doing at all. Um, then we should have the full use of the property and the flexibility to provide the services that our community is asking us for. And the length of time it took us to get those really small things, Sylvia, for these kids was offensive to me. So um, so anyway, I, I, I want to just um, make a request uh, that when these bi-monthly reports come that we get an update on the, on the full panoply, because I know there's more than one service there, and I think you raise a good point about um, you know, just about the the opportunity, frankly, to have some of them, you know, co-located and then which of them may not be in the future. But I think that's an important discussion for the board, especially if we have an opportunity to find either a more reasonable rent, which we probably can right now. Um, and second, if we have an opportunity to purchase, which makes more sense. And, and Supervisor, absolutely, I can bring this back. And I know during the, that last effort, there was a significant amount of community engagement, so I want to make sure that we're doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And that's that's the most important thing. I'm really glad you um, reminded me of what our focus is to be focused on those on our clients, which is why I imagine you're looking at staying there. But there is a question for me nearby or all, all of those options. Uh, Sylvia, did you have any comments or questions on this item? 
Great. Well, thank you very much. With those two changes, we don't need an action on the item. Is there anybody who'd like to speak on this? We do item? have one request to speak online. Great. Thank you. We'll uh, take Paul that Soto, speaker. you'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hey, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for the concept and the idea. Whosever idea it was to come up with something like this, it's important. Um, most of the kids that commit violent crimes are between the ages of 15 and 25. I know because they ended up as my cellies. And what I, what I started noting about 20 years ago was that all the people, all the lifers that were in jail for, for killing somebody, they got locked up between these age groups. They went to YA and then they transferred to, to prison. So this is a very, this is a core group of people that are, that are especially vulnerable to becoming uh, either victims or uh, perpetrators of murders, violent crimes. And so, especially since where they come from, and that's another important piece that I wanna talk about, is the location. Now, you're going from 591 King Road to Parkmore. I mean, you're going from east to west. I mean, how does that make sense? Now, if you're really caring about these kids, which I assume that you are because you're building a facility for them, then why aren't you considering location? Because they're not going to they're not going to be traveling to the west side. That 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 is just not it makes absolutely no sense in terms of its location. Because if you think that you're going to get kids from the east side and they're not, oh yeah, let's just go over to the west side and it's cool. You know, we got bus lines and get, it's not about bus lines either, especially not for these kids. Because these kids are the, the reason why it was located over there was because it was consistent with the barrios, where the barrios are, where they all meet, what the children are used to and accustomed to. If you relocate something, that's going to disconnect them from their community. And that in itself is going to become an issue is because they're not going to be connected to the community that they are familiar with, nor the social economic class. That is a different social and economic class in Parkmore. You need to start taking that into account. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much, and thank you for that uh, feedback, Paul. Um, one thing I, I do just want to acknowledge um, is that the location um, was review, was frankly um, discussed, and engage, we engaged foster youth who are currently using our system to get feedback on that. And I think that is why um, we're recognizing that there there may need to be more than one location, and you know, with with. Um, and we, the other thing I would just say is we'll want to look at the services in both locations, um, perhaps side by side, as these come back in the future. So with that, we're going to close public comment. We're going to thank our staff. Uh, thanks, KJ, for the good work. And we'll look forward to getting more information at the next uh, report that will be inclusive of the uh, disposition of the current location and the service, uh, the di service differences as we know them, if there are any. So now I'm going to turn to item five, and this is to get a report our, from the VASC. And so if we can ask our VASC team to come forward. Welcome. Honey, you need to turn that, yeah. Still not working. Good afternoon. There we go. Um, good afternoon. My name is Hani Tran, and I am the senior manager of the VASC. Um, I'm joined here by my colleagues, and I'll let them take a moment just to introduce themselves before I present the report from the VASC. Good afternoon, Mikkel Lee. I'm a Division Director with Behavioral Health Assistance and Supporting the VAST in Transition. Good afternoon, uh, Lim Lee, Program Manager with the County Exec Office. Thank you. And so first, we'll provide a construction update. Um, and so uh, construction of the VASC is complete. 
um, we finalized uh, sort of two final projects, and that was the completion of the second floor emergency stairwell, as well as um, the third floor. We've received the certificate of occupancy for the third floor. So with that, um, uh, in terms of major construction projects, that is complete, and so hopefully this will be the last construction update. You will be hearing from us with respect to the building. And then moving on to programming updates for the first, uh, I'm sorry, for the third floor, and, and that again was the final floor um, where we were finalizing the construction. Um, in terms of programming, um, we've started transitioning um, uh, programs from our current service providers as well as our current community-based organizations onto the third floor. And again, that's to expand our existing um, workshops and classes and support groups um, just so that we can increase the utilization and increase the access of these programs um, for our community members. Um, we'll be launching um, some additional program programming um, soon, and that includes some of the items um, noted on the presentations, um, including um, a homework center so that our local students can come by and um, work on their, um, uh, their homework and get some support from sort of college mentors. We'll have open collaborative spaces so that students can drop by and work on projects together. Um, community members and community groups will be able to reserve meeting spaces on the third floor. Um, and we'll also have additional programming like a computer lab so that laptops will be available for our community to use. With respect to outreach and engagement um, for the opening of our third floor, um, in December of 2023, um, uh, our vast team met with our uh, partners for, uh, from community-based organizations just to share with them our plans to open the third floor this spring. Um, we um, walked them through um, the floor and we provided them with the online um, meeting room reservation system and gathered their feedback. Um, in uh, January, so just last month, uh, we did a soft launch event for our key stakeholders and held a press event so that we can share with the media, again, the launching of the third floor, walk through the meeting reservation system so that they could uh, sort of preview the suite of new services on the third floor. Um, of course, on February 3rd, we had our Lunar New Year that celebration. Um, and uh, with that, we um, uh, hosted resource tables on the third floor and invited community members to the third floor so they could preview, um, uh, again, that new floor, uh, shared with them our online reservation system. And so those were a few of the sort of events we had just, um, again, to share with the community that we were now um, going to be launching the third floor. With respect to um, our VAS website, um, some updates about the sort of information that we're, um, we have on the website about as well as translations. And so um, that project is in progress. Um, we have added um, uh, more information of our services to the website. So you might notice that the information on our website is a lot more robust. Um, we're still working on um, adding translations. We have the information, much of it in English, but we're still sort of um, uh, um, working on um, being more complete with our Vietnamese and Spanish translations, and so that is in progress, but we do recognize that that's an important piece um, of um, the sort of outreach that we have to do just so that um, our services are um, available and accessible to the community. And then with respect to um, our online facility use reservation uh, process, um, and so um, again, our online reservation system was launched in a piloted manner um, in December of 2023. Again, that was for um, our community-based organizations that were um, already hosting programs um, on, um, on our site. But we kind of shared with them internally the reservation system so that they could kind of walk through it and provide us with um, helpful feedback so that we could tweak it before we launched it to the public. Um, um, again, and the plan is in March of 2024, so next month. And then you'll see in the next few slides just the different um, landing pages uh, for the meeting room system. You'll see on this slide here, this is where the um, meeting room reservation tab will fall on our website. 
once folks click on that, they'll be able to review um, sort of uh, some of the um, policies that we have and then click on the button in order to select a room. On the next page, um, our community members will be able to view the various meeting rooms that are available to reserve. And once they select the one that they're interested in, they'll be able to sort of select the time frame that they'll need the room for. And then after that, uh, they'll be taken to a calendar um, so that they can see um, the availability of that room. And on the next page, folks will be able to add their contact information, um, their details, and uh, share with us additional information about the program, including the number of attendees and how they will be using that space. Um, and then finally, they'll submit the form and then um, our VAST staff will review that request and we'll respond to them um, once we've had a chance to review the request to see um, whether uh, we could um, sort of formally approve the request. And then um, uh, after that, once the reservation request is approved, our VAST staff will send a sort of DocuSign packet to the, um, to the person who's booking the space, um, just an agreement so that they can review and sign. Um, and then with that, um, they'll be able to reserve the space. And that concludes um, our presentation, and we welcome any feedback or questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? We do have one request to speak. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Congratulations on the progress that you've made on <clears throat> establishing this facility in the community. It looks uh, it looks promising. I like its location near History San Jose. I think I'm going to be using that for some of my um, historical preservation work. Um, so I think I'm going to take it through the process to see because of its proximity to History San Jose, it makes it convenient to go there and then be able to go to uh, History San Jose itself afterwards or or before. Um, the questions that I have around translation, and, and it troubles me that it's almost like an afterthought that we're considering translation. Translation should be primary. Let me remind you of the beatings and the straight, just, just inhumane, vicious torture that children experienced inside the schools in Allen Rock School District, San Jose Unified School District, and Eastside Union School District for speaking Spanish. Now, you see, it's, and, and the reason why that is, that it's almost translation is like an afterthought, is because this county or the city has never, as a whole, uh, San Jose or the county Senate has never actually accounted for that. They have never acknowledged it and accepted responsibility for it, ever, as a government that permitted this, this type of acts towards the children. I don't speak Spanish because of it. I, in my own, my own ability to speak Spanish, was completely disconnected from my entire community as a result of that. And now translation is an afterthought. It should be primary. And I would suggest that this facility do not open. It does not open unless that translation for both Vietnamese and Spanish is up working and, and, and viable so that the community can access this. And that's what I'm proposing now, that it doesn't open until that happens. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I'm going to close the public comment um, period and see if, uh, Sylvia, do you have any comments? I do. First of all, I just want to say congratulations um, on that third floor. I know, Supervisor Tavis, you've been working really uh, diligently to ensure that our community has access to all the floors, and I know that last floor was the last one, so congratulations to everybody on getting that completed. Um, I was wondering just a little bit about the request for the use of the rooms. Um, there's times that I know um, there's groups, uh, say I had a, a, a huge park in, in my district, former district, um, which is Welch Park, and um, you would think that cricket is not that popular in San Jose, but they would have 
uh, cricket games every Saturday mm. <laughs> for like the whole year they would fill it up. And so a lot of the community that lived in the surrounding area of the park couldn't really do a lot of the things that they wanted to do and use the park that they wanted to use it. Um, mostly you know, for soccer games. Um, and so I wonder how, how are we gonna manage or how are you thinking about managing some, uh, uh, some requests that might entail or might ask for a whole year round um, usage of a room or how, how do you anticipate providing some, you know, some parameters so that it's equal for, for the folks who, who are using it and then for new groups who want to get in on, on, on the fun too. <laughs> you raised such an excellent point, Vice, uh, Vice Chairperson Arenas. Um, I think um, what we're um, realizing as we're rolling out the opening of the third floor is that there are some of these sort of tricky issues that we have to navigate. Um, as there's many groups that are going to be interested in using that space as well as the first floor. And so we're um, in conversation, I think, with um, different um, entities that have, um, in some sense, a similar reservation system to learn from them. Because I think they've also um, come um, upon these issues as well. And so I think as we're rolling it out, and I think as we see that there is um, uh, sort of um, the need to kind of place on some of these parameters, right, then we, um, I think, will start implementing that just to ensure that um, many different groups and as many of our community members and organizations as possible are able to access the space, um, especially the groups that um, are providing um, sort of um, services um, uh, and activities that are aligned with the goals of the VAST to serve our local community. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I don't envy your position in trying to determine who gets um, priority. Um, I just hope that, it, like you said, you tap into some of the resources that we have on site. Um, Parks and Rec probably have a lot of um, insight in terms of just scheduling, just, just the technical mm -hmm. uh, issues. And, and the, the other um, question I had is, would groups need to have an insurance um, to be on site um, and to carry on some of the, I don't know, maybe they have a dance class, maybe they have, you know, what, would they, would groups be limited if they were just, you know, a free kind of range group that comes free together <laughs> and is like, we really love, uh, is, yes, Zumba, you know? Um, but we, we'd love to use your room uh, in order to do that. How, do, how does that work? I'll start first with answering that question, and I might rely on my colleagues who have a bit more institutional knowledge as to how things were done last year to chime in as well. But um, I think we we see that there's different sort of um, uh, types of groups uh, that are going to be wanting to use our space. And so it could be a larger nonprofit that's wanting to use our space for a one-time large event. Um, up to 120 people where food would be served, where we're seeing that um, in other county facilities. And it, it makes sense for a certificate of insurance uh, to be sort of provided, or potentially we're exploring um, through our county, helping to streamline the process for them to kind of purchase like a one-time special event sort of insurance. Yes. So that's sort of one bucket. And I think there's um, another bucket where, uh, you know, we have groups coming in sort of for weekly use of our workshops, mm -hmm. um, sorry, providing sort of weekly workshops to our community. And then uh, sort of with those groups, and if I understand it correctly in the last year, they've been able to kind of provide that certificate of insurance. Again, I think because they're a bit uh, more organized. And then there's that third bucket of folks, which I think um, uh, Vice President Aranis, I think this is sort of what your, um, your example was alluding to. It could be student groups or it could be neighborhood associations where that could be a barrier. Yeah. And um, uh, we at the VAS want to be sure, want to work really hard to ensure that's not a barrier for them in terms of accessing our spaces. Um, and so um, that's something that we're going to look into, but we're working really hard to ensure that these requirements um, won't be a barrier, but at the same time recognizing that there's sort of liability and sort of other pieces that we have to consider because we're a county facility. Mm -hmm. But again, I think, again, the VAST model, we're gonna to try to streamline that process for them, make the space sort of as accessible to the community as possible. 
I love that. I, I noticed you used, used Streamlink like three times, and I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, all in, in an effort to provide access to our community. So um, good luck. I'd love to, to see how it all turns out. And, um, and hopefully one of these days, I don't know, maybe I'll have a staff retreat at the VASC and use your, your facility. I or love Zumba. that. Or Zumba. Or you and I could be free range uh, Zumba players over at the VASC um, and invite our teams. That would be fun. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. We invite you all to come test it out. And I'm sure you all will have wonderful and helpful feedback for us. And we, we welcome it. So thank you so much. Congratulations thank once you. again. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I just had a couple of observations. So first of all, um, uh, I wanted to say to the staff who's been holding down the fort, uh, to Mikkel and, and, um, and I'm sorry. I. I'm blanking on your name right now. Liam. Liam, thank you. Uh, Mikkel and Liam, oh my goodness, right? Like, thank you. Because Mikkel, you had 32 jobs, and Liam, you were stretched like taffy. Every time I saw you, you were in charge of everything. And so I just really want to say how deeply, deeply grateful I am. And in particular, because this is such a new service model for us that you were learning while you were doing with departments that are not always even in the same building, let alone collaborating the way that you have so thank you and honey welcome I'm so excited to see um, you know this new leadership and and frankly some fresh eyes I feel like we've all been looking at this with such um, scrutiny and intensity that I can tell you every complaint we get and all the <laughs> Mikkel and Liam know that um, but but to have this new kind of perspective and I think the point that um, Supervisor Arenas raised about just the enthusiasm that you know people really want to be in the building they want to be present um, and there's all those different um, issues that you have to balance and the one um, request I would make as you're thinking about that balance is that um, I think um, your, your point about learning from other facilities that we already have is a really good one. I will also say that we don't have many facilities that really welcome the public the way the VASC does. And for me, it is a new service model that I want to see us exercising through, throughout our bodies of work. And it's part of the reason I've been a little bit... Um, so focused on not just this, but the hub in terms of whether or not we build facilities for the for the client and our staff versus our staff and the clients, because really we have to consider both and and really in that in that order so that we're using public space well, but also because we're it allows us, I think, to do a little bit more um, innovative programming than maybe we do when we we block people out of the buildings we want them to have access to in the first place. So anyway, I know you're going to have a lot of work in that area. I have a, some programmatic questions that I just want to make sure um, that I'm, I'm understanding this. The, on the health and benefits uh, application assistance, my question is for each of these uh, applications, you know, for people going through this process, I'm having a hard time seeing the the um, if the if we, we have individual clients that are coming in for health coverage enrollment assistance. Does that mean we have folks on scene that can actually process them f from soup to nuts for that for particular product for health insurance? Thank you for your questions, uh, Chairperson Chavez. So our on-site team, we, we partner with the social services agency, uh, Department of Employment and Benefit Services. Um, you know, uh, there are co-located staff uh, who are on-site that can assist our clients to begin the application process. But in terms of the um, eligibility and determination of benefits, um, that still happens uh, back at, uh, on, on Center Road where um, the, uh, um, the, the team, um, the, the headquarters of the, of the department, if you will, um, uh, are doing the eligibility work and connecting with the client to informing them of whether or not the application has uh, you know, met the eligibility criteria to receive benefits or not. So we don't have eligibility workers at this site? Uh, we do not have eligibility worker at the VASC. So, um, and maybe I, sh I should know the answer to this, and I don't know if anybody up here does. Um, do we have eligibility workers?
uh, co-located in any of our clinics? Does anyone know the answer to that? I assumed that we did in a number of areas. Okay, we do. So, but we don't have them here. So I'm gonna, I, I'm not gonna, you know, you don't, you only know what you know. And so what I'm gonna suggest is that um, when the next report comes back, uh, that we have a deeper dive into how that's working. And I, and I just wanna say, um, we, uh, for me, we, this goes back actually to the theme that, um, that Sylvia just raised about zero barriers. So if we want people to sign up for SNAP and we want them to sign up for um, you know, medical insurance or any other um, service, having the eligibility workers on site that have the ability to do that to me is pretty critical. So uh, if we could just come back to how that operates now, because what I am concerned about is I look at the number of services, and I don't know if those are unduplicated clients, but it has 189 in October, 215 in, in November, um, but I am interested in diving into those numbers because we, we should be in the zero barrier business, and so far not, you know, and it, by the way, the SNAP application, I, I can't believe what we try to get people to do to get food. It's really appalling. So the idea that we would work with someone and then send them off is something that I just find really troubling, and especially because we attract so many seniors to this site. Mm -hmm. It would be, you know, so in any case, I think you have the message. Let's discuss that at our next uh, report out, if, if, that, if that's okay with you as well. And then, um, and what, what are all the applications that are, um, that we're able to help people with there, and then what's the process for actually get, getting folks the services they need. And then another area is under the community programming services. I, I see we have community and senior wellness activities and classes and workshops. What I am, on this section, are these services that are being provided by our nonprofit partners primarily, or are any of these county services? Um, actually, it's both. Uh, we have um, we partner with behavioral health for some of these health and wellness uh, programs, classes, and support groups, uh, as well as community uh, providers. So one um, one reason that I'm interested in understanding the um, the mix of the service provision is I think it's going to help us understand uh, in the future how to design new facilities to be able to outline who's providing uh, what services. And frankly, I don't, I don't think the county needs to provide all of them, but as we're thinking more about um, you know, being culturally appropriate, language appropriate, and, and frankly, even getting expertise in some of the work that we're focused on relative, yeah, well, let me just give you an example. Um, I know our, our senior services team at SSA is really small. Like, I feel like they're the small and mighty team that's trying to, and we have an onslaught of people that are aging every day like all of us, right? And one thing I'm really interested in understanding is how we're sharing the responsibility to do things like the classes that um, um, protect for balance, the you know mental health services that we can provide if we can in groups because that's you know thinking about the sustainability of that part of the work. So again, if this could be broken out and maybe we just have a discussion about the services, I think that would help all of us up here who are thinking about um, each of the new bodies of work that that and the new innovations and frankly, even the health study that you have going on, um, Sylvia, I think could benefit from understanding the structure here a little bit better. And now, and honestly, because it's not new anymore, you have something to share in terms of what you've learned. Um, so I, again, I just wanna say a very big thank you for all the, the, good, um, the good work. This is such, it's really exciting and moving all in the right uh, direction. And, and I, I just wanna say too, as it relates to community outreach, I wanna implore you to, um, work with the board offices as well as the other departments to do the outreach because whenever we leave somebody out, they call me. So please, no mas, right? Let's see if we can get everybody a big hug and nobody gets left out. And, and, and I think if you inform the board, it actually gets into our newsletters too, right? And then, then we've all been 
uh, brought brought together. So thank you. So no action except uh, some direction on what we want to see back, and it's really around programming. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you to that your amazing team, really, each and every one of you. I'm really, really grateful. This has turned out better than I imagined. Thanks. All right, so we're going to go on now to item uh, six, and this is uh, regarding period products. If I could ask the staff to come forward. Welcome. You know what, you're not on mic. Ah. There you go. Ah. Good afternoon, uh, David Bruno, uh, Program Manager with the Office of the County Executive. Hi there, Sarah Fernando, Manager, County of Santa Clara, Office of LGBTQ Affairs out of the County Executive's Office. And uh, we do not have a uh, formal presentation, but we're available for questions. Great, well first let's go to public speakers who've had a chance to see or read the report. We have one request to speak online. Paul Thank Soto, you. you'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for making this consideration of uh, having feminine products placed inside the restrooms. Um, I'm concerned about the vilification of men and that the county actually supported language that made men dangerous in general. Now, what you stated inside your uh, pilot is staff has undertaken a small pilot group uh, talking about uh, because a focus group indicated that they would feel unsafe accessing period products in public spaces in men's restrooms. Now, we're all intelligent adults here, and what you implied in this document is that men in general are dangerous. This is what you did. Now, you wouldn't accept this if we said that implied that somehow or another the public in general was afraid of accessing restrooms that LGBTQ community members could access. You would not tolerate that. At under any circumstance, under any condition, would you tolerate that? As a man, this is disrespectful. This is very disrespectful as a member of the gender that the county allowed for that kind of statement to be allowed in your documents. As a member of that gender, that is disrespectful. Because I can guarantee you anything, anything even close like that to happen anywhere in any restroom, it would be the men that would be doing something about it. Guaranteed. Guaranteed it would be the men doing something about it. And what you did is you blanket statemented by allowing this focus group uh, uh, statement to be placed here is that men are dangerous and you did that to us, the county. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Um, so first of all, let me just say this project has just been um, ongoing for a while and I just wanna say thank you because I know it has not been uh, an easy project and I'm really excited that um, the county and you know frankly that we were having discussions about this prior to COVID-19 made it possible for us to get menstrual products out far and wide during um, during COVID-19 and there are a couple of organizations that I'm still thinking about the Young Women's Freedom Center being one and the Alliance for Girls and really and honestly Sarah your team as well just helping us think about how to make sure we could get access um, to, to products and diapers. I mean, it just allowed for a lot of com good, I thought, thoughtful conversation and very honest conversation about how expensive these products are for so many people in our community. Um, I'm excited about the learning modules. And what I wanted to ask is how, could you just talk a little bit about how they will be accessed and how they will be used today? And then what you, you know, for as part of the pilots and then what you see as the next steps? Yeah, great question. Um, so, in reference to the training, the training was created in collaboration with our office, the Office of Women's Policy. 
um, the uh, Office of Communications and Public Affairs and Learning Organization. Uh, with the training itself, we featured uh, county employees of transgender lived experience telling their stories uh, regarding accessing restrooms as well as accessing menstrual products. And uh, with this training uh, and through the uh, help with the learning organization, uh, we were able to take that video and add not only learning objectives, but also um, knowledge checks to accompany the training so it's an actual learning kind of like experience. Uh, right now it's currently available in the SCC platform for any county staff to be able to use and experience and uh, take for themselves. Um, it's not mandatory at the moment. Um, however, it is an option for all staff to be able to take this training. Uh, right now in terms of strategy and, and amplifying out and and outreach, uh, what we're planning to do is promote the training on the SCC Learn platform on the top page. We're also including it in our LGBTQ uh, cultural competency suite of trainings, and we're reaching out to uh, people managers, supervisors, managers that uh, have experienced uh, LGBTQ plus cultural competency training through our office. We're also adding this as uh, another form of training that our office offers. Um, maybe and I don't know, Dr. Luna, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but for all of our managers, um, are they required to take, what kinds of trainings are they required to take? Do you know? And, and no is okay. If you don't know, that's all right. Uh, there are a suite of required um, trainings, and it sort of depends. I don't think this is a required training, and I'm looking at Sarah, who would know. Um, strongly recommended, but not required. So I, I will just say um, to you on behalf of the, the Office of the County Exec that one thing that I think would be beneficial is if we could get an off-agenda report that just explains when you're going to manage other human beings in this organization, what is required training today um, and, and what is strongly suggested. And the reason I think that's important is that in a, in a workplace as diverse as ours, um, having I mean, I mean to frankly, just first of all, I think training, I mean, managing and supporting other human beings is really difficult. All of you know that because that's what all of you do. And it's probably what you spend 90% of your work on and it's overwhelming. And what I worry a little bit about is as we are graduating people up to manage other people that we, first of all, personally, I don't think we should do that without people having training. Like I don't think one person should manage another without training at all. But secondly, as people move up um, and those responsibilities get more um, significant, I think that's when we have sometimes challenges with people genuinely not understanding laws or culture, and that's what gets us having conflict and ten tension in a workplace. So if we could get that information, I think it would help us make a decision about, you know, perhaps even here, if we wanted to make some recommendations about what should be um, mandatory, and that includes the the um, training that is being done relative to equity and GAIR in particular, because GAIR I, I know is a little more baked. I mean, that may be a, I don't know if that's the right term for it, but it's older than some of what we're doing. But I'm just interested in what's what we make available, what's required, what's optional. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Do you have any comments on this? I know that the, the video, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, my sciatica is like flaring up. Um, uh, so, so the video currently is, is internal. I was really hoping you were gonna show it today. So when you say you didn't have a, a presentation, I was like, oh, shucks, I wish we, we could have seen it. Um, and I think it's a wonderful idea to, to figure out like what is strongly suggested versus what is mandatory and and the opportunities that we have to actually show some of these videos to our public who come into our county buildings, right? There's always a monitor somewhere. Um, heck, if we have to take out the, you know, the squeaky uh, tray with the old uh, TV box and put it in the hallway and just keep on a loop some of these uh, videos that are sometimes really interesting as you're waiting to get information from the information desk or just, you know, 
we don't really have a line anymore for marriage licenses, but um, in other um, county buildings as you're waiting for whatever it is that you're waiting for. And here you have an opportunity to see this awesome video that normally you might have not been able to catch, right? We're all busy and we get it. And it's, even if it is one click away, sometimes it's just nice to have it on a loop. Um, and then connect it with, with a, um, a month that is uh, deemed you know, appropriate to connect with in terms of mm -hmm. themes or whatever, right? I just think that we could be a lot more strategic in how we share what we, what we have internally because there's so much that the county already has in terms of resources. And it's just a matter of how do we disseminate it in a way that makes sense and that is fun and that, um, you know, short of clickbait, you know, how do we get people to, to click on, on the links that we want so that they, we can all share in some of that knowledge, right, that, is, mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. um, talking about. Because as, as we all know, um, our workforce is changing, right? And there's, there's norms that when I first started working, that's definitely not what we have now, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and not to say that I'm old, because I'm not. That's not what we're talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about change and just evolving, right? Um, so, so I, and, and, and an opportunity to learn. Because even if, we, if, even if we think we are an evolved person, we might not have all the correct lingo or mm -hmm. the current information. We just need to have the whole picture. And sometimes there's like, the, you know, maybe one of the, I think is part of the caller's um, comments is like it, when it's, when, a, when um, a phrase is taken out of context, it might seem offensive. But when you see the whole picture and what we're um, hoping to accomplish, then you see the purpose. Um, anyway, so so I, I really like I really like that idea, um, uh, chair. So that we can, in terms of figuring out what is what is um, mandatory, what is strongly suggested, and then ways that we can actually get the information out. Um, because I'd love to, whatever, um, whenever you have it ready to go for public um, availability. And I love that we use county employees. That's awesome. And uh, hopefully there's a day where we say sanitary napkins or pads or and any of the things that, you know, we use uh, during a certain time of the month and we're not embarrassed to, to say it anymore, right? It's not like, hey, do you have? Mm -hmm. it, it is part of nature and that's who we are and that's what happens biologically. Uh, to some of us, and that's what we have to deal with, right? And so how, how do we all support one another um, in order to um, just to have some equity in terms of access to tampons and maxi pads and always, and now I'm just going on with the, what, what did you say? Diapers. Yeah. And diapers. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, okay. I just meant bigger pick. Yeah, you're right. Your, your point about just what's happening in the world and how we get more commonplace about making them available and talking about it. I thought you were making a jab at my age. But no. you know what? I'm <laughs> going to let not. it go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I'd love to see the, the, the link to the video. So if you would send it to me, I would love to, to watch yes. it on my own. Thank yeah, you. That's that. great. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah, and send it to the, the whole board, I think would be really good. Um, you know, uh, Supervisor, if you don't mind, there's an I, an issue that you raised that I, I want to just ask if we can perhaps get um, county our county communications from the CEO's office to have a conversation about, because you raise a really good point about how information is disseminated in different parts of the county, and how, you're right, how many screens we have all over, and I think, you know, we have department heads here who probably have things that they prioritize, you know, information as someone's in your waiting room about very specific issues, uh, but you raise an excellent point about whether or not it makes sense for us to better understand kind of how, how we're using all of our interactions, and, and given that we have a a communication department in the CEO's office, it may be of value to have them come and have a conversation with us about how they 
how how they're advancing getting information out through those broad networks because I really don't I don't know the answer to that that's a really great question about we might be behind the times I mean you know the, nobody's on Facebook anymore it's all TikTok right. Insta is you know everybody's stepping over that one too I, I don't know what the next thing is I don't pretend to know but, yeah, but that's a good point. but we need to somebody needs to Somebody under the age of 20 or 30 <laughs> <laughs> should tell us all. <laughs> and, and frankly, a lot of our communities are using WhatsApp really. Oh, that's um, true. Really, really a, yeah, a, a, to true. get information out, by the way. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, I was meeting with a group of folks and they asked for us to give them some information in, in, to use for WhatsApp very specifically. And I... I didn't know how to prepare it for them. Like, of course, I had to go to the youngest person in the office and ask that question. But nonetheless, um, I, I do think it's worth the discussion. And what I would just say, if we could say this through the county exec's office, if you could give some thought about how to shape a conversation like that and you know, when to bring it back uh, would be great. I, don't, I won't put a timeline on it because I'd be interested in your thinking about it. I don't know. Thank you. Keep it up. I know we have, we have more to do, but you're really moving in the right direction, and I'm just really grateful for the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to verbal reports. And I just want to say to my colleagues, congratulations that we're actually doing this before, um, before everybody's running out of the room. But one thing uh, I just wanted to share it with you, Sylvia, that I, I asked my staff when, because we, I knew we'd have a little more time for verbal reports than we normally do. Uh, but also to make sure that we got some of the budget issues lifted, you know, I mean, lifted up just in terms of what's happening at the state. Uh, be, just because I, I frankly, um, I think both is we're fighting to protect ERAF money. Um, I, I'm curious about what other issues that we need to be having our eyes on and also just to make sure that, um, that, that we can get the best information that you wanna share with us today. And, I, and we'll start with um, Dan with you. Yeah, good afternoon, supervisors. So um, I'll, I'll start out with the preface that we're, we're, this information is going to be based on our, our kind of best estimate on what we know today. We know there's going to be a May revision. Um, we also know with many of the items in social services, it's dependent upon how the state um, determines the, the percentage that they distribute throughout the state, throughout the different counties. So um, the information I'm presenting today is based on today's, um, today's formulas. So as of today, the, um, the governor's budget includes about an 11.7 million lost SSA programs. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the three um, the biggest items is a complete elimination of the CalWORK subsidized employment program that also include, includes intern and earn. Oh. So my staff are working, I'm sorry? sorry intern and earn, so the, 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 oh, the, youth, the youth employment, yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. My staff, so that's uh, approximately 310 total families. Um, so my staff are working on, again, a kind of a projection of what that would look like cost-wise. Um, complete elimination of the family stabilization program, which is 2.3 million. So that's for families that are in CalWORKs that, um, to help with emergencies that come up that maybe prevent them from being able to uh, get, get employment or participate in the program. So that's about 45 families a month. Um, and then uh, the final one is 6.9 million to CalWORK single allocation, uh, which funds eligibility and employment services. Um, the kind of big piece with this is this is also what funds some of the childcare. Um, so our childcare uh, for families in CalWORKs has grown by 75% over the past three years. So again, once we get a little bit more specificity from the state, um, I think we can present a more detailed impact to the actual clients. Um, this is just based on kind of what we are today. That's what I have for that. And now, now it's not and, and a lot of good news, news around the budget. Um, um, I will say around our, some of our other programs, but there wasn't as much. It's mostly, it's mostly around the employment and benefits. Um, if I can, before I pass it on, just maybe give some good, a good kudos. Um, we received a, a note from an a general, a individual that we served through Meals on Wheels, and I thought if I could just spend some time and share what, what, he, what he gave to our staff. So. Um, so I just wanted to say thanks to everyone there, not only for the food, but also for the happiness that Meals on Wheels brings me. I'm a lonely old man. However, on my refrigerator is two years of Thanksgiving cards, Christmas cards, and Valentine's Day cards from my wonderful friends from Meals on Wheels. 
and the man and woman who have dropped off my food have all been nice to me. I'm in a wheelchair and sometimes my body hurts so bad that I can't get out of bed, so I left a note on my screen door to bring the food inside, and they always do. I feel very blessed to have Meals on Wheels in my life. So I think it's just a, it just shows, I think, the incredible impact that that program has, and I think the staff and the county and the, and the providers. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, it, could you just say uh, the, the 11.4 million um, is over those three programs right now? The 11.7 the also includes some programs that are in the, the child welfare realm, but I was gonna leave those out for a separate discussion. But the majority of that amount is within the employment and benefits. And um, do you anticipate, I, I know there's no crystal ball, but are you hearing any other kind of rumblings around other program areas? You know, I think whenever there's an updated amount that the, the deficit goes up, I think that there's a collective holding of breath across the counties and in the social services realm, but I haven't heard anything specific. Thank you. Did you have questions for Dan? Thank you, Dan. Oh, we do have uh, two requests to speak online. Oh, thank you. Uh, next speaker is resident. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, yeah, so well. One thing that uh, was omitted from this report is, well, what I want to know, maybe this can be addressed in a, in a future report uh, by Daniel Little, is why does it seem like um, when Valerie Houghton is involved in a case, why is the county um, neglecting to, um, to, to conduct screenings when there are reports of child abuse? I mean, like I mentioned, Violet Brooks, um, her three daughters did not get a screening and Valerie Houghton was involved in that case. And I, I, um, I, I uh, challenge you guys to go look up the case. Mackenzie Brooks uh, and her two sisters filed a lawsuit against the perpetrator and, and they outline the two of them until the age of 18. They outline all the abuse. Um, this is completely unacceptable in this county that um, we are throwing these kids under the bus just because they're involved in a family law case or um, somebody well-connected is involved in the case. Um, that, uh, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really terrible. And we, we need to really start addressing it because up till now, it, it seems to me like addressing it is taboo. Like you're not allowed to do it. Um, you're, you're told that you're amusing people when you when you tell them, and it's just it's just not right. And I really hope that, that we can get some change in this county. Maybe it does involve replacing Daniel Little. I mean, like I'm not saying for sure, but it looks to be the case. We we need a we need a person who has compassion for children and for families to be head of social services to to be the correct role model um, for for social services and for the DFCS, I mean, we Next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. From Horseshoe, please forgive me um, for the person, uh, forgetting your name, the person that gave the report, but I want to thank you for giving that information. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get like very clear, very honest um, data and information about what's happening in our county. And what you did is you provided the kind of information that I would expect from like, like an auditor. You know, somebody that just gives objective information, no opinion on it, but hey man, look, here's the facts and this is what we're looking at and then backs up off it. And I appreciate that, what you just provided. And now to the to uh, Supervisor Chavez and, and, and Arenas, we speak a lot about the protection of these very populations that are gonna be impacted. We have 310 families, no employment, their income is gonna be cut. We've got 45 families uh, that are going to be cut. CalWORKs, child care has increased 75% over three years. That is, the, and, and, and that right there is going to be one of the programs that's going to get the ax. I mean, this is, this is a, you know, so when we're talking about racial equity, now, now let's expand this conversation and contextualize it within the context of racial equity. Now, it's no surprise. I can tell you exactly who these families are, and they're going to be members of my community, period. 
period. This is, this is just fact. I don't need the data to tell me that. Now, the question really is, what are you going to do about this? Okay, because there's millions of dollars disseminated out to all these other programs and all this stuff. We're building freaking facilities on the west side of Samo. I mean, the west side of Santa Clara County. So I'm, obviously that money can't be touched. So what I want to know is, what are you going to do about it? Huh? When you guys talk, you guys, because you guys talk a long, long masa about being protectors of the children and the families. Well, here's your opportunity. What are you going to do about it? And that concludes our request to speak. Oh, thank you for that. I'm going to move over to DSC, uh, DCSS. Sorry, Ignacio, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll preface my report out on the state budget impacts the same way that uh, Daniel Little did in terms of uh, we'll uh, hold our breath for the May revise and see what happens there. But uh, as a reminder, DCSS is solely funded by state and federal subventions, so we do not receive any ongoing county general fund support. Uh, in uh, January, when the governor released his FY25 state budget, um, there was no additional funding aug augmentation for the California Child Support Program due to the state budget deficit. Um, the state's budget allocation methodology for California DCSS offices, which is actually codified in statute, um, was established back in fiscal year 2020. It was updated for FY25. Uh, the updated allocation calculation has a, a significant change for Santa Clara County. For the first time since the methodology was established, uh, Santa Clara County DCSS is now officially, and I'll use quotes, considered underfunded uh, based on the most recent calculations and primarily due to many years of reduced staffing and cuts. Um, back in FY20, we were required to develop a glide path uh, to get us down to the appropriate uh, staffing levels, uh, cases to FTE ratio. So we've achieved that now uh, after many years of difficult cuts and staffing reductions. Uh, unfortunately, we still will not receive any additional funding in the FY25 budget due to the state's budget deficit. However, for any future years, if we're able to maintain this, then we would be in discussion to receive some additional funding. Uh, just to give you some perspective, of the 52 county DCSS offices, uh, some are regionalized, um, 18 are considered underfunded, um, and now Santa Clara County is part of that group. To give you some perspective, we're underfunded by approximately 600,000. Um, LA County is underfunded by about 52 million, according to the calculation. So kind of gives you an idea of where the spectrum is for those underfunded counties. Um, we've cons been considered underfunded since the methodology, we've been considered overfunded, I should say, since the methodology was originally established. Um, the current methodology uh, governs the distribution of any additional funding to local county child support agencies and is still based on that cases to FTE ratio. The current ratio is 181 cases per FTE as a threshold to determine eligibility for additional funding. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is that in Santa Clara County, we're considered a net outflow county, meaning our caseload continues to reduce uh, approximately 3 to 4% per year. Uh, so the challenge there is when you're looking at a ratio that looks at cases and FTEs, when the cases keep dropping annually, we have to then have corresponding reductions on the staffing side to keep pace with that ratio. So that really is one of the biggest challenges for Santa Clara County. Uh, most county child support offices are seeing some level of reduction in their caseload. Uh, in the Bay Area specifically, you're seeing this 4% on average reduction. We're seeing a lot of families moving out of the area due to high cost of living issues uh, to areas that tend to be more affordable, especially in the Central Valley, Sacramento, and San Joaquin County areas. <clears throat> Santa Clara County uh, DCSS continues to absorb any uh, annual cost of living increases within our flat state funding allocation by reducing staffing through uh, holding positions vacant and then eventual elimination of those vacant positions. Um, until the department receives additional funding, we'll continue to use that consistent strategy and evaluate carefully and deliberately which positions we're able to fill so that we're not uh, filling positions and then having to deal with layoffs on the back end because of that. So uh, we're very careful about that analysis. Um, as part of that, we look at compliance timeframes, regulations, statutes, uh, also any mandated requirements we have with our existing plans of cooperation that we have not only with the state, but also with the Superior Court. 
Um, so with that, I'll answer any questions you may have about our, our current budget situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll see, Colin, do we have any public We do have one request to speak. Paul Soto, you have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, Mr. Guerrero, for your report. Your, uh, your analysis of the reduction in the need for services and that you reduce staff commiserate with it, and then give in your comment and justify as to why that is. And it's not necessarily, we would all like to think that it was because fathers uh, stepped up and were able to pay what it is that was necessary in order for the support of their child. But, and sometimes information data can be exploited because the data is not necessarily explained. You know, and you did an excellent job for me as a public, as a, as a public advocate in a lot of these different meetings, the way that you stated that the reduction and you justified the reduction in the numbers of people that are uh, involved in your system. And you justified that because sometimes politicians can be a little bit, they can catch something like that and know that there's no reason. And what they do is they give the justification for it. And it could be a false analysis of that data that is provided. So for that uh, uh, additional analysis of what that data means from your pro pro professional perspective, I as a member of the community really appreciate that. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. Um, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, I only just, I, I had one and, and it is to say that it's the, um, it's been really remarkable how much work your team has been able to get done in an environment where you've been cut, cut, cut over the years. And by state, you know, flat is really backwards. And what's been fascinating to me, what I don't really understand in terms of how the state thinks about your work is it's odd to me because it's, it's like employment services. It's almost the last thing you would think about cutting if you really want to help people and families stay on their feet. And I think that's been true for the work that you've been doing for a long time. One question that I have is that um, the, and I think your point about us being underfunded, it's funny, I, I felt like we were always underfunded. And so now that they say it, it's like, yeah, where were you five years ago? Um, but one question I have is, is the ratio at which um, folks like, are we seeing the ratio in in populated areas or big cities like LA or San Francisco all dropping in that range of like, you know, three to eight percent? And is the is that corresponding growth just popping up in San Joaquin and other places? Yeah, they've done a, an analysis in the southern part of the state, and they're seeing similar trends there, where folks are moving out of higher cost of living areas like LA County. And then uh, in the Inland Empire, whether it's San Bernardino, Riverside, or even down towards the border, Imperial County, you're seeing a uh, corresponding increase. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's really happening statewide. And I think what we're seeing is families looking for ways to be able to manage the economic challenges that they have and looking for ways to be somewhere where it's more affordable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank your team. All right, we're going to go on to um, probation. Welcome again. Now, will you say your name again? Well, my former name, it, formal, is Bolivon, but I go by Vaughn. Vaughn, okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, thank you, um, Supervisor Chavez. So my report is brief. Um, f for the probation department, we do not um, anticipate the state budget situation will um, negatively impact the juvenile probation department. Um, all our allocation appears to remain the same. Um, however, we might have a minor um, impact to our adult probation. And is that what is that? Do you know what that is based on? Is that a, is that a particular approach the governor's office is taking? My understanding is um, based on the allocation from example, like the 2011 realignment that's already um, earmarked for us. But if you need more details, uh, we can provide a written one after. Right, and I and I imagine as as the budget becomes more clear, we'll we'll see all of those. The, re the reason I was curious about it is that the responsibility that we're taking locally has been so dramatic uh, since a realignment, which is really devolution, right? And so, um, so I'm I'm just interested in understanding where they're making cuts at a state level, and in part there there are a number of issues that are related to that, but one of them is 
so much of what your your budget is really embedded in the general fund, but you have matching grants all over the place. And so I'm really wanting to understand what forces us to leave money on the table that we could be drawing down because they're not paying their part, you know. And so anyway, as you if you give thought to that, it would be great for us to understand that better. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, any public speakers? We do have one request to speak online. Paul Soto, you'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. As a person that was on probation from the age of 12 to 18 in this county, um, in and out of juvenile hall, um, I was privileged and, and, and it was very um, like life affirming to be at the La Raza Roundtable last month and Judge Estramera, the recently appointed Judge Estramera and uh, uh, Judge Lucero were both there, where they, they were present and they had talked about, especially Judge Lucero had spoken about the, the juvenile probation system and just juvenile incarceration in general. And to, to be a person that was literally victimized by my county, there was more than 300 kids in juvenile hall at any given time when I was going through there. And to be a part of the generation to see the the acceleration of people being just processed in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And, and the, the, there were people in the room that understood what my experience had been inside of this county in the 1970s and 80s in the juvenile system was, was like I said, it was life affirming. I mean, it, to, to sit in a room where people were very concerned about reducing that. And I wanna thank the uh, probation department for the work that you have done on the juvenile side. That has been exceptional, exceptional. If you were in the room and you heard like what everybody was saying and talking about, about what happened in what is happening now in the juvenile system and probation, it, it would have it would have really made it would have made your whole week. And and so um, I'm appreciative of that. In terms of the realignment, we're going to continue to have a necessity for these reintegration programs. So um, I, I'm sure that uh, Supervisor Chavez is taking note of that and how we are going to uh, do what we can as a community to ensure that those services for that reintegration process are, are, are there to be accessed. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. And I'm gonna turn it to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Supervisor. Um, so the good news for our office is that we do not anticipate that the state's deficit will have an impact on our work. The main, um, the major initiatives that we're overseeing, which are the child care infrastructure grants and the um, early care and education workforce grants are funded through the American Rescue Plan Act dollars and the general fund. So we think those, we don't anticipate any changes to those funds and those agreements, which is great. Um, in terms of state legislation, the deadline to introduce new bills was last Friday. So our office has been working with IGR to monitor those bills really closely and they'll be in committee um, in the upcoming week. So there are a couple of bills specifically that we're looking at around um, child care program eligibility, uh, consumer privacy rights of minors, family food and security, um, and some trainings for family conciliation court evaluators and a couple others that we're tracking. And so we're um, working pretty closely with IGR and um, county departments as appropriate to monitor those. And I think IGR said they'll be back in April with an update on that at this committee. So that's exciting. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any public speakers on this side? We have two requests to speak. The next speaker is resident. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, I'd like to ask Mrs. Duffy if there's anything that she can do to help help my kids. I mean, I've I've emailed her and, and filled her in on what's going on. And I just want to ask her, can you please help me get a screening for my kids? Um, I, I understand that there are conflicts of interest. Um, perhaps you can address that. How how can how can those be mitigated? I mean, I'm at my wit's end here. I've already litigated with the county and I'm prepared to litigate further to get my the screening that's appropriate for my children to uh, be conducted. Um, please, please, I mean, uh, county dollars, the, the taxpayers footing the bill for all this. Um, I mean, from the DA's office that's prosecuting me um, after I um, 
made a complaint about this child abuse uh, to Mr. Little, who's collecting a paycheck right now for not uh, conducting a screening and who knows what else he's getting. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you don't do things like that for free. I mean, um, but I, I, I'm not sure about that and I don't wanna imply anything more than that. I just, it just, it's suspicious to me. Um, but uh, back to the point, please help me get a screening for my children, Ms. Duffy. I, 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 I know that you, you handle all the um, legislation and, and uh, for the county children and, and, and you had everything about uh, children. Um, please help me. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Paul Soto. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe to the caller. Please contact a woman named Susan Bassi, B-A-S-S-I. -S -S Her first name is Susan, S-U-S-A-N. Contact her. She's a reporter for the for the Davis Vanguard, and I think she'd be able to assist you. Um, with respect to uh, Ms. Duffy's report, she mentioned uh, American Care Dollars, and that because of that funding source, that there would be no lapse in, in services within her uh, sphere of influence. But what I'd like to talk about is that, is that a lot of the programs that we have now that we enjoy, that nonprofits in our in our in our community profited pretty handsomely their incomes were increased by those dollars however those th those monies are going to run out because those were grant allocations by the uh by the government and so it kind of gave a semblance of this kind of artificial complacency and that, that that complacency with the way the system is working now um is because of that money. Now that money's gonna run out. It's gonna start running out like real soon for a lot of these uh, programs that were funded through that source and not accessed through the general fund. So we have kind of an, a system that has been artificially maintained through the grant allocations by the federal government as a result of COVID. Now, we still haven't been, uh, we still haven't experienced the impacts of COVID, and that's going to be one of them. One of the greatest impacts on our economy is going to be that a lot of these programs were funded through those monies, and when those monies are gone, what is going to happen? And I'm going to be here to make sure that my government is held to account as to what that looks like, because I'm going to be guiding it the whole way. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, let me just say thank you to all of you, and we'll look forward to continuing to work with you on the budget. Um, and we are adjourned, and our next meeting, uh, let me see when our next meeting is, will be um, March 28th. So I'm going to do a quick reminder that on March 23rd, we're doing the Women's Summit at San Jose State University. It's going to be a lot of fun. So if you can join us, it's free, and it's. I think it starts at 8.30 or 9. 9? starts at nine and we'll end at four. So feel free to join us. Thanks all.